This book is very brief, but it is perfect for our needs. There are some mistakes which I hope to point out as we go along. We begin by looking inside the microprocessor and notice that there are three buses, address, data, and control bus. The address bus has an arrow that points in one direction, which means it can only communicate in one direction. The data bus has two arrowheads, which means it's bi-directional that can communicate in both directions. The control bus is an actually more complex. Sometimes it can go in both directions, but sometimes only one direction. Here is a more detailed look inside the microprocessor. The most important thing to take from this diagram is that there are five ports, as you can see, A, B, C, D, and E. And these ports are used to communicate to the outside world. Again, sometimes they're in one direction, sometimes bi-directional, and then sometimes they're in between. There are many other registers that are used for holding data as we go back and forth between buses, but also to decode uh, instructions, opcodes, and other commands, but I will see later on that we can ignore these other devices. Here is a much more simple model. This is called a programmer's model, and in reality, this is the model that we will use when we program the microprocessor. In other words, we're not really interested in the internals, simply how to use the microprocessor. Notice there are two accumulators, A and B and all mathematical and logic operations take place in the two accumulators. There are two index registers, X and Y, which are used for counting, and they're 16 bits so we can count to higher numbers. The program counter keeps track of the program, numbering each step by numbers. The condition code register keeps track of the mathematical operations, that is, do we have a negative or a zero? And finally, the stack pointer points the, in the direction of certain complex operations, which we'll cover later on. The book says that the heart of the microprocessor is the bus. If you notice a little slash across the bus, it means that the bus is eight wires wide. In other words, the microprocessor is eight bits, so it's eight bits wide. At any given time, only one device can be attached to the microprocessor by means of the bus. That is why all chips, all RAM, ROM, all devices have a chip, have a pin that's called output enable not, chipset not, or strobe not. And in order to activate the device, you take that pin low. Meanwhile, all the other pins are taken high, which means that they, are, they appear to be disconnected from the bus. What can we do with an eight wire bus? First, we tell ourselves, what is two to the eighth power? It's 256. That means that we can attach 256 bytes of RAM or ROM or EEPROM or do mathematics in 256 uh, different numbers. Of course, as we increase the width of the bus from 16 to 20 to 32 wires, then of course the number of things that we can attach to the bus increases dramatically. Also, the amount of mathematics that we can do increases also. For all microprocessors, there's a memory map, and this shows what is attached to the bus, but also what is the hexadecimal number of the device. Everything is done in hexadecimal in microprocessors. Let's say we want to calculate how much EEPROM we have. Notice that EEPROM is contained from B600 to B7FF. We need to do a little hexadecimal math. Let us subtract, let us take hexadecimal B7FF minus B600. Well, that equals 1FF. Of course, we need to convert that to decimal, otherwise it doesn't do us any good. For that, we need a calculator. And then we can go ahead and see that's 511 in decimal. How much ROM do we have? Well, of course, it's FFFF minus D000, which equals 2FF. F, F. If we convert that, we can see as 12,287 in decimal. For that, we need a more simplified calculator, which I'll show you later on as we go through the semester.